The 39 Clues Double Cross Book 1 Mission Titanic by Jude Watson Attleboro, Massachusetts Revenge is sweet, but humiliation is sweeter. And world domination is a definite plus. He stood on the knoll overlooking the mansion. It had burned in an, and it had been rebuilt. Stronger, better, just like him. The children were inside, the ones who thought they knew what they were doing. The undeserving. His plan was in place. He would defeat them, Th own them. What they'd done to the Cahill family was unforgivable, made the Cahills soft and stupid, vulnerable, open, a loose confederation of family instead of the dense, glittering network of brilliance and strength it should be, exchanging ideas about how to share rather than control and dominate. Grace, you would weep if you saw this. You were never soft. You had that ruthless streak. Until the end, when your, for when your fear overcame your reason, you gave it all away. It had taken years of planning, but it was together now. Rest easy, children. Your world is about to implode. First, there was Napoleon Bonaparte. He set out to conquer the world and succeeded. Became a general at 24, crowned himself emperor of France about 10 years later. He did spectacularly well until that disaster at Waterloo, when the Brits beat the pants off him. What happens when you suppose when you surpass your role model? Ian Cabra as he Ian Cabra smiled as he climbed onto a step stool and faced the mirror. So much handsome, stared back at it. It was almost too much. He smoothed back the lock of dark hair that kept falling in his eyes. Imperfection was just annoying. At seventeen, he was head of the most powerful family in the world. Plus, he was taller. Take that, cousin Napoleon. Ian didn't think that genetics was destiny, destiny, but it was a definite plus having Napoleon in his family tree, as well as Catherine the Great, Benjamin Franklin, and Winston Churchill the greatest strategic minds in the history of civilization were all related in the twisting branches the, and tendrils of the Cahill family line. Even today, the real titans, giants of industry, technology, finance, art, music, athletics, endurance, were all related to him, from Nobel priests prize winner scientists to Edith Laverne O'Fleury of Norman, Oklahoma, who patented a new sewing machine, Bobbin, at the age of 92, and treated herself to a new armchair recliner on the proceeds, which were somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty million dollars. Edith was an ECAT, the branch of the Cahills that was studded with science and technology geniuses. The Thomas were exceptional physical specimens. The Janus, the creatives, were the artists and dreamers who set the world on fire. Ian's own branch, the Lucians, were, like 
cousin Napoleon, brilliant strategists and thinkers. And then there were the Madrigals, the under-the-radar branch that had come out of hiding only recently. Ian had been born a Lucian, thank goodness. Ian still felt a deep loyalty to them, but it was a Madrigal as well. The Madrigals were now the leaders of the Cahills because they were the only branch the others agreed to trust. Yes, the Cahills were exceptional, but they needed someone to lead them. Enter Ian Cabra. From a control panel by his bed, he could activate screens that would put him in touch with Cahill family leaders all over the world. He could put the entire mansion on lockdown, order people to do what he planned, and strategized and request his morning tea. You sure you want another quarter inch, bud? <clears throat> Seems kind of short. The tailor stood in the master closet, squinting at Ian's trouser legs. From his position on the step stool, Ian frowned down at the tailor. Mr. Junis Funicello, I gave you precise me measurements from my London tailor, and you delivered trousers that were an inch and one half too long. There is no mistake whatsoever. He gestured at his suit. This could be done right. I have an important meeting in a week. So you said already, three times. The tailor set out his box of materials and, sighing heavily, bent over to fold Ian's trouser hem. What Americans didn't know about tailoring? Trousers should be a precise length. What was hard about that? A graceful curve on the shoe, not cascading like a waterfall around your ankles. His cousin, his cousin Jonah Wizard's trousers, painful to look upon. Living in the United States after London, well, it had its challenges. You had to put up with the honors, well, the horrors of tea bags, for one thing, and he was constantly having to explain things. How, when he told the driver to put his suitcase in the boot, the driver just stared at him, as if trunk made any cinema, 20 films in one theater, now there's a concept. He suggested to his cousin Hamilton Holt that they try the lift instead of the crowded ele escalator. Hamilton had lifted him in his arms and carried him up the stairs. Humiliating. As a Thomas, his cousin had an impressive physique, but surely even Hamilton's brain could grasp the British term for elevator. He was homesick for London, for fog, real marmalade, and people who understood hand tailoring and the class system, people who knew how important his family was, even though he had disowned them. Only his father was left, and Ian was perfectly happy never to see him again. Raised by vicious snobs, it was true, but snobs with money and style. Ian admired his suit, appreciating the mirror, the mirrors that gave him a total view of his appearance. He'd had to install them when he'd moved into the master bedroom. He'd created a secret safe room and taken the opportunity to expand the closet. As the former head of the family, his cousin Amy Cahill had supervised the renovation of the half-destroyed mansion, 
but a girl who lived in gray t-shirts and blue jeans did not understand this, the importance of walk-in closets.